increase the RPM to about 1200. In reverse? Yeah. Oh. I have to say, when you actually start to know what you're doing in voting, it makes it so much more fun. What are you doing? My birthday. What does that mean? <laughs> it means you do something scary. <laughs> Jumping in this water on a foggy day is scary. Hopefully you can find your way back to the boat. <laughs> the fog's pretty thick. So when you turn 29 for the 10th time, you celebrate with uh, a cannonball. I just gotta do it fast before I change my mind. <laughs> <laughs> Need a push. Oh my god. <sighs> Wanna do it with me? No. Okay. <laughs> I got myself out pretty, <laughs> pretty quickly. It's not that bad once you do it. It feels so good I can do it again. Woo! Woo! Go for five. Two more. Two more. Woo! This is so good for your body. Woo! So why am I jumping into freezing cold water? Well, it's my birthday and I like to give myself gifts in the form of scary things and things that I've been putting off for far too long. See, when I turned 29 for the second time, I ran 10 miles achieving a goal I had on my mind for months. Now turning 29 for the 10th time, I'm challenging myself to 10 cannonballs into 53 degree water because it's mentally and physically challenging and I've had it on my mind for weeks. 10. I think 10 more how hard. You know how you get free cryotherapy? You go anchor out in the Pacific Northwest. I feel like I have so much energy right now. I survived my 10 rounds of cannonballing into 53 degree water. It was not that bad. I would do it again tomorrow. And now the fog is lifted. So we are moving on to the second part of my birthday gift. When Sean asked me what I wanted for my birthday, I said, I would love a tutorial of how to set up all the electronics, how to plot a course and get underway all by myself, obviously with the help of him, but showing me start to finish how to do it so I can start to get smarter with our boat. I also asked if he could do it patiently and in a good mood. Because <laughs> a lot of times when we do this, he gets impatient with me, I get frustrated with him, and it's just easier to have him do it like he normally does. So today, I'm gonna get a tutorial on like turning on all the electronics, setting everything up, plotting a course, learning how to do that, and getting us back home to Seattle. First things first though, Sully is still in his pajamas, so we're gonna get him out of his jammies and then get underway. Okay, we've got a little bit of a mess going on here with Sully's toys and wardrobe. So since it's October, we are going pumpkin. Going pumpkin patch, buddy?
All right, today I'm gonna to teach Elizabeth how to get the boat prepared to get underway. The procedure is a little bit different if we're at the dock versus at anchor. Today we're at anchor and all the electronics are off right now. That wouldn't be the case. Normally when we're at anchor, everything is on so that the boat is prepared to leave at a moment's notice and for us to be able to monitor the current situation. If we're drifting at all, what the wind is, what the depth is, all of those types of things. But in order for her to learn, you need to learn with all the electronics off. So we're gonna power up the electronics then we're going to plot a course uh, back to our marina, back to Seattle today. And then we're gonna go ahead and get the engines fired up. We're gonna get the stabilizers enabled and centered. And then we can start pulling anchor and, and get underway. You ready to teach me? Yeah, are okay. you ready to learn? Yes. This sounds like a good gift. It's ultimately gonna help me out. Yeah. All right, so the first step uh, before we can turn all the electronics on is we need to make sure that the appropriate breakers on our electrical panel are switched to the on position so that we are able to power them up go to the electrical panel and the switches that we are going to be turning on are 12 volt switches so they're on the upper uh, portion of the panel and the column of switches uh, furthest to the right is where we're going to find the switches we're looking for so the first switch we want to turn on is the one marked plotter that's for our multi-function displays and our radar the next switch that you're going to turn on is the depth sounder located right below it and then the next is our cameras switch turn that on that's for the aft facing camera in the cockpit and the camera in the engine room then you'll go ahead and turn on the vhf that's our radio the cell booster can be turned on the nema 2000 that's the network of all of our connected uh, sensors on the boat like our wind meter things like that and our gps antenna the next switch is our autopilot go ahead and turn that on instruments can go on and then the final switch to turn on is stabilizers so now we've turned on all of our switches. It is time for us to power up the devices. Cool. So you like to always start from right to left. So we're gonna start right to left. Yeah, everything let's on. go ahead and do that. We've turned on our power switches. So now we're gonna turn on each one of the components. So start with the AS and turn on the power. Power. Then move to the first Simrad display, turn that on. Then the AP60 autopilot on top, you can turn that on. Then the next Simrad display can be turned on. And then the computer can be turned on, and that switch is found on the right-hand side of the monitor towards the top. It's a little button, just press it once, and the monitor comes on. Now all the other devices have warning banners on, so we need to acknowledge all the warning banners. So each one of the Synrab displays has a warning, warning banner, and then the AIS controller has a warning banner as well, which can be acknowledged by pressing the left arrow on the trackpad. So we're all turned on. Anything else? Radio? We'll do the radio last just okay. so we don't hear a bunch of chatter while we plot our course. Okay. All of our uh, routes and charts are interfaced through Coastal Explorer. So you're gonna open up the Coastal Explorer application. Once that comes up in the upper right-hand corner, that position box right now is yellow. That means we don't have a GPS fix. We wanna give this just a minute to connect to all of the sensors on the boat on the NEMA network. And once that happens, those boxes are gonna turn green. So they just turned green. Our depth is reporting in, our heading and our position data is all reporting in. If it wasn't green, that would mean that there's a problem with the connection between the computer and the boat network. So we're in good shape. Right now we see our position on the chart. If you actually pan around on the chart, that, that green triangle is our boat, but you can uh, use the scroll wheel to zoom in and out and you can use the left mouse button and push and hold and you can pan around on the chart. Anytime you wanna bring the chart to putting our boat back in the center, there's the go to boat icon in the bottom. If you click that, boom, that restores our boat to the center of the chart. So if we wanna create a new route from where we're at now back to our home marina, in the left hand uh, bar, there's that line with a bunch of dots on it. That's our voyage planner. In the Voyage Planner, you're gonna click Add Route to create a new one. And now if you go onto the chart and you left click everywhere you wanna place a waypoint, that's how you draw out a route. So how do I get back onto the track since I clicked away? Whenever you double click, that assumes you wanna end the route. So if you wanna keep adding waypoints, if you right click on your last waypoint, and then click uh, add to end of route. Oh. That's gonna allow you to continue on oh, cool. placing waypoints. And I wanna stay outside of the shipping lanes, obviously. 
Yeah, so the way shipping lanes should be treated, if possible, stay out of them. If you are going to travel in a shipping lane, you want to travel in the direction of the lane that you're traveling and stay out towards the outer edges. And if you're crossing a shipping lane, you want to do it as perpendicular to the direction of travel as possible so that you can get through the lane as quickly as possible so you're not impeding traffic of a commercial vessel. So now if you double click on that end one that it's going to end your route and now you can go ahead and drag the waypoints around sort of clean the route up. Okay, so our course is plotted. We are good to go now. How do we get this officially set up as our course? It is all we have to do is activate it when we're ready to leave. The next thing I'd like to do is name the course so it's saved in our voyage library and we can retrieve it again. So if you just click on the on the route. Right in the screen? It, yeah, but not on a waypoint, like on a straight leg of the route. Okay. Go to details. That brings the route up again. Or at the top where it says Port Gamble to the Corinthian Yacht Club, double click on that. And that's the name of the route, so you can call it whatever you want. I would take out all that center stuff and do Port Gamble to Shilshil. And then if we want to find out how long the route's going to take, you'll see our total distance is 26 miles. Let's go ahead and set what we think our average speed is going to be. Right now it's set at 7 knots, so it's going to apply a, a global setting across our route at 7 knots. You can actually break up each leg of the route and assign specific speeds based on currents in the area. But we'll just set an average up at seven knots. Let's go ahead and choose a departure time so we can determine when we're going to get there. The software also will let you work backwards. You can put in an arrival time and uh, based on your segment speeds, it'll tell you what time you need to leave to get there on time. Okay, so we have all the electronics on. Obviously it's boom, 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 turn them on, power them on. We plotted a course, which was so easy. I can't believe I've been intimidated by that for years. And now uh, what next? Uh, now, since we're at anchor, our anchor alarm is on, so we're just going to turn that off before we go. We've already cleared out our tracks to see if we we're drifting, but let's turn the anchor alarm off. So you're going to hit pages on that right-hand multifunction display. And then using the rotary dial, once you get to the pages screen, you're going to go to the second page. So scroll over to the right and then go to alarms. And then the anchor alarm where it's checked, just uncheck it. And we're all good. Then you can X out of that screen and we're back to our chart. Then we'll go ahead and turn on the VHF radio. While we're underway, it'll be on channel 16, but to pull the anchor and be able to communicate with each other, we're gonna put it in hailer mode, so you can hear me up at the foredeck. And I can talk back. And you can talk back and the whole anchorage can hear you. Our electronics are fired up, our route is plotted, our anchor alarm is off, the radio is on. It's time to fire up the engine. Okay, the engine is fired up. The next thing we need to do is enable the stabilizers. So when the engine is running, there's a, a power takeoff on it, which is a hydraulic pump that supplies oil to the stabilizing fins. So you're gonna activate each one of the fins and center both of them so that they're ready to be deployed once we get underway. Now it's time to pull the anchor and try out your route. Okay. Hopefully it keeps us in safe water. Okay. Going to reverse. Reverse? Yeah. Got it. And uh, increase the RPM to about 1200. 1200. Uh, oh, in reverse? Oh, I have to say, when you actually start to know what you're doing in boating, it makes it so much more fun. And when both the captain and the first mate, partner, boyfriend, girlfriend, husband and wife, whatever, can both become knowledgeable, it makes it so much more fun. So if you've been like me forever, for way too long and have stayed dumb to all of this because you just don't want to deal with it. Learn it. Ask your partner for your birthday next time to be in a good mood and forward. Forward. 
be in a good mood and teach you this stuff as a birthday gift, it's awesome because it's free and you will realize how easy all of this stuff is. So we hope you enjoyed this video. If it inspired you to learn more about your own boat, I hope it did. And uh, we'll see you next time. Thanks for watching. Permission to course. Stabilizers activated. And we're off. Hey everybody, it's time for our weekly Q&A with the captain. We got several questions teed up for you today. So let's go ahead and get started with our first question. Our first question this week comes from Jim and Jim lives in Salt Lake City. Jim asks, do you feel safe on your Nordhaven when the seas are rough? Uh, we feel extremely safe in the Nordhaven. There's a lot of redundancy, there's stabilization, dual autopilots, manual steering, tiller steering. The boat is about three times heavier than a similar power boat of the same size. Uh, the doors are solid, the windows are thick, so we feel about as safe as you can in a boat this size. Uh, we obviously have a tremendous amount of respect for the sea, and there's always going to be conditions um, that make us feel uncomfortable. So planning correct weather windows is always important, but we feel extremely safe in our Norhaven. Jim's second question is, how much do you steer the boat uh, versus using the autopilot? When we're on passage, the autopilot is engaged basically 100% of the time. The only time we hand steer the boat is usually for a close quarter maneuvering. So docking the boat and you know maybe in marinas and tight spaces. But other than that, the autopilot is, is usually in command. Jim's third question is, do you wish you had diesel heat for the Northwest? Uh, it, diesel heat is a great feature. I think if we were going to stay in the Northwest um, forever or for a really long time, we absolutely would consider diesel heat. However, at some point we want to cruise south and at that point diesel heat won't be necessary. So rather than spend that investment in the boat now, we're going to continue to get by using our reverse cycle heating and air conditioning units as well as our uh, electric space heaters. And uh, next week's video, you're going to hear about another upgrade that we've done to our boat to make it more comfortable during the colder and wetter winter months uh, within the Pacific Northwest. So stay tuned next week for that video. And then Jim's final question is, how can I convince my wife to buy a Nordhaven? For that question, I'm gonna need Elizabeth to help me uh, answer it. And we're actually gonna answer it in an upcoming video. So I will defer that question to that upcoming video. So stay tuned for that. Our next question this week comes from Grace and Jean. Grace and Jean live in Sumter, South Carolina. And they ask, can modifications be made on the Nordhaven 43 to make it great loopable? So in order to do the America's Great Loop, uh, there is one fixed height bridge that I'm aware of south of Chicago on the Illinois River. And I believe the bridge clearance is between 17 and 19 feet. Our boat from the waterline to the top of the pilot house is about 15 feet from the waterline to the top of the molded stack is about 16 or 17 feet. And from the waterline to the top of our mast is about 35 feet. So at a bare minimum, uh, our boat would have to, it would need the mast to be removed. And then our mast also is used to support our exhaust system on the boat. We have a dry stack exhaust. So the exhaust would need to be modified to accommodate that lower height. So I think technically the boat could be modified to make the make it possible to do the Great Loop Passage. Um, however, again, it would take those modifications. Our next question this week comes from Fred. And Fred lives in Fayetteville, Georgia and ask, are you ever concerned with safety while cruising in less traveled areas? So in the Northwest and British Columbia, we are definitely not concerned with safety, um, even when we're in very remote areas. However, as our travels expand and we start to go to other countries, there are gonna be areas of the world that, that are less safe and we aren't gonna feel as comfortable. So for that, there's a lot of websites where cruisers can report in what the safety is in particular regions of the world. And also when transiting through those areas, we believe that it's best to do those transits in numbers. There's generally uh, many flotillas that you can join and uh, groups of boaters that transit certain areas during certain cruising seasons. So I think that that's the best way to cruise through areas where you have any concern about safety is to cruise with a group. Our last question this week uh, comes from uh, Tim, the Dutch guy who lives in Belgium. 
Tim the Dutch guy asked, what kind of licenses do you have to operate your Nordhaven 43 on those uh, Northwest waters? So I have a United States Coast Guard captain's credential, captain's license, and then Elizabeth has the uh, state of Washington boater safety credential. So in the state of Washington, at a minimum, you do need the state of Washington boater safety credential. So we have that and we have my captain's license. As always, thanks for all the really great questions and thanks for watching our videos. If you want one of your questions answered in an upcoming video, check us out on Instagram and drop us a message with your question and we'll get it answered in an upcoming video. Have a great week, everybody. We'll see you next weekend.